desperation seeking to crack melanin where sci-fi ends on the spectrum of light we begin Good evening. Welcome to Ralph Reads, brought to you by T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. My name is Ralph Anthony Garcia, also known as R4. The legal, the loyal, the regal, the royal, Ronin Ralph, your master of ceremonies. Please like, share, comment, subscribe, join the channel starting at 99 cents per month for exclusive members only content. For instance, the uncensored versions of each and every one of these episodes on Ralph Reads. Tell a friend to tell a friend to tune in to T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. On tonight's edition of Ralph Reads, Volume 3 of the Biography of Little Willie the Barber, The Gentleman Pimp, written by Andrew Stonewall Jackson. Continuing reading and writing excellence, let the reading commence. Chapter 7 When I got back to the edge, all the cats and their ribs started right in on jiving me about my young tidbit catching them, and I went right along with it. By that, I mean, whenever someone is pulling your leg about something and you want to ice it, just go along with them, and they'll soon freeze it. While I was being bullshit, I said, yeah. Stonewall Jackson started out young in life, seeking fame, and he's still young and smart at the game. Yeah, he got a rib on the edge. Her nesting on you, her tricks may sometimes feel their 
splash now. Bring them all. Up. Now you us till she comes to work after she gets out of school. So you n can call me school days if you want to. Cause as long as I'm the one that checks her trap, I'll be anything you come up with. As I was about ready to end my spiel, my man Walter cracked. Go on and pimp, Stony. To hell with what any black chip of a snippet tag I say. Well, I soon got the rep of being the youngest pimp in Detroit with the finest, tastiest bitch on the stem. And I was getting backdoor stuff from a man's rib. Roof's first night's tap was understandable, and I set out to do just as Walter said. Pimp, and to hell with every nappy head son of a bitch in Detroit. Life to me was on the kosher side for the following two months, and then Ruth hit me with the bomb. The little bitch out of the clear blue told me one night that she was going to have a crumb crusher. After she hit me with the curse of life, I said, Look, sweetheart, how do you know you're not uptight? Not only do I know, I also know when it happened. How long you been hit? I cracked. Last month when my womanhood didn't show, I thought about it. And this month when it failed to come forth, I knew for sure. Damn, I said to myself, this is a drag. Just when we're about to get things in order, you gotta come up with a crumb crusher. Damn, what a bogue hand for fate to deal me. Stonewall, it's not right for a father to call his kid a crumb crusher. Look, sweetheart, you don't have to force the brat on me. I'm sweet on you, and I want you, so don't push on it. Daddy, I ain't forcing you into nothing. The baby's yours. Come off it. The kid could belong to any one of the tricks you had. I cracked. Honey, that's when you're wrong. Can't you recall telling me when I first hit the bricks to always use a safety? Well, I've been doing just that, and no other man other than you has ever had me without one. You told me that the same day you ran everything else down to me. Like, never go to a trick's pad. Like, getting the bread off the top, baby. It was that day you told me a lot of things. And I've been doing just like you told me. She said. Yes, sweetheart, I know, I know. But right now, we gotta find a way to get this handicap out of our lives. I got a cousin that's hip to the route of getting something like this out of our way. Oh, no, you don't. I want this baby. And I want you to stop thinking about killing it. She said. Look, little mama. We can't have a crumb crusher now. We're too young for that kind of thing. There's too many places to go, too much life to live, baby. In short, it's a handicap to people like us. After we do a little living, we will have a house full of kids, righteous? Then on the other hand, what will your mother say? Daddy, you're doing a lot of rapping, but you ain't saying a damn thing. As far as my mother's concerned, I doubt she'll say anything. She knows more than you realize. She knows I'm hustling on Napoleon and Stoney. She herself had a kid when she was younger than me. Damn. It seems life can also carry a club and deal a man a bogue hand when it wants to. Well, I said to myself, I can't be tagged with this. Me having a kid will cramp my game. No wants a cat with a family for a man. And since this bitch really planned to have the baby, I had to get me a fall guy to take the weight off me. I thought about it for a week, and at long last I came with a patsy. So one night, after Ruth and me had gone home and had eaten and smoked a little pot, I said, Look, baby, can you recall that old fellow that was forever trying to get you to come in his pad whenever you passed him on your way to school? Yeah, Daddy. She said. But I never did, because you said not to. Yes, yeah, sweetheart. Good girl, I said. But the next time he hits, I want you to go in and see what he wants. And keep it in mind that it's business all the way. Try to let some of the folks in the block see you go into his pad with him. And this time, I want you to ice the rubber and let him get a shot of pure honey. After you've done it, let me know about it, and I'll take it from there. She agreed, and fate was kind to me.
Cause the very next day, the old crab hit on her. She did as I told her. Plus, the old crab gave her $30 for the trip. I let a month or two pass, and I told her to tell her mother about it. She hit mom, and he went to Jackson Prison for Pierrero Schatz. After the old fellow went away, she said, Stoney, we both know when I have this baby that it's ours, even if someone else did get a bum rap for it, don't we? Sure, sweetheart, we know, but let's keep it between us. No one should know. Not even the girls or fellows on the edge, righteous? Ruth had now become large enough for the world to know she was pregnant. The fact that she was pregnant caused her to steal many dates from the other that gigged on the edge. Damn near every man likes a bitch when she's big and young at the same time. This makes it a double tree. Some men also get a bang out of having a girl that has a mustache, or a girl with hair on her legs, or a bitch with pleasure-bent legs, bow-legged, will even upset a sissy. As a man, I feel deep down in my heart that a female with pleasure-bent legs, a mustache, hair on her legs, and pregnant could make a man walk a mile over hot coals with no stumps on to cop. The aforementioned rundown in a true analysis in this little tidbit of mine. If you're a man, you know what I mean. And if you're a female, watch out for girls with these assets. Root worked like this till it was time for her to drop the baggage that she'd been carrying for the past nine months. She had her kid, a boy, whom she named after me, and her mother loved it and took care of it like she would her very own. Everything was once again back in divine order. Mom was looking out for the kid, which gave me and Root our freedom. I had stopped driving for Walter and his wife's mob. So one day, he hit on me to help his wife be the first door. Stony, he said. Ruby got a first door that's a bird's nest on the ground. If someone could get the sales girl off their asses for a few minutes, that could give us time to cop. Stony baby, I'm asking you because no one in Detroit can get them the freedom they need but you. Thanks for the bullshit about me being the only one, I said. But there's just two things I like to know. Where's the spot, and what's it worth to me? The spot is in Gary, and if it turns out righteous, you got four bills coming from me, and four bills coming from the ape. I know you're macking now, and we both know eight bills will buy a lot of cocaine or take care of anything else that's bugging you. Righteous, I said. I need the chips. What time will she be ready to split? As always, Stoney, that'll be up to you and her. I went into the hat shop and called Ruby. When she picked up the phone, I said, Hi, baby. This is your honey dripper. Walter just ran down that Gary run to me, and I told him it was righteous. Must be some way out mix. Four bills for me to drive and store? Well, you know you'll have to hit another spot along the way, sweetheart. You know, to take care of our thing. Don't worry about our thing, she said. Just tell me about that schoolgirl, you cradle robber. I heard about her stealing all the tricks while she was big. Damn, man, what kind of guy are you to have a girl that young out here hustling when she's about to have a child? Stoney, you're a cold-blooded man. Honey, hush. You know better than anybody the kind of man I am, baby. I'm your kind of man. The kind of man that's been letting you put the Georgia to him. And nine to five says you're gonna want to rip me off tonight, too. Georgia, you? She said. That's a laugh. Yeah, you animal. You got at least ten years on me. As far as my girl's concerned, bitch. 
you're older than Black Pepper, and you've been ripping me off for a year. And it ain't but four years difference in my age, and that slash little as you call her, she's close to me, so f and I'm 17, so feel free to call us both teenagers. But with you, hot model, it could be said that you're ripping the cradle off. Alright, Stoney, that's enough of that bullshit subject. I want to know what time you think we should get to Gabby. She said. Like any other trip, we gotta get there at lunchtime. So call the ape and be ready to split at six. We blew a kiss and hung up. I then went by another young pimp's pad. I'll call him Chuck. Chuck had two girls kicking mud around city of Detroit. He was teethed on the street of broken dreams, the same as I was. Me and Chuck sat around rapping and smoking and kicking sad and his old all over Detroit. I told them nothing about the trip I was to make in the morning. We got in this packet and rode up Hastings, stopping at all the bars where the good ribs gigged, trying to catch. But it turned out to be a dry run. I had him stop by Roots. When we got there, Roof's mother gave me a grand greeting and said hello to my man. I asked her where my girl was, and she said she was in the bedroom. I asked my man to cop a squat, and I went into the bedroom where my rib was. Hey, Ray, I said. How you feeling? Hi, stranger. She cracked. I was wondering when you'd be by to check out your girl with the sore ass. I leaned over and kissed her, and then sat on the bed. I was all wrapped up in my thoughts on just what a tender, sweet little bitch Ruth really was. And I kind of felt lucky to have such a with so many miles in front of her as my very own. As I was having all of these thoughts, she said, Is Chuck the one that's been keeping you from me and your baby? Sweetheart. Get this into that pretty head of yours, I said. Chuck or no one else could prevent me from seeing you or my son. Have you seen the baby yet? She asked. Yeah, I saw him. And baby, he looks just like you. Bullshit, she said. You know damn well he looks like you. After bending each other's ear for a while, she asked me if I was hungry, and I told her I was hungry enough to eat a wet mop. She got up to fix me some grits, and I embraced her, and sent her out of the room with a soft slap on her tender ass. While Ruth was fixing the food, I was rapping with Mom. I found out just how much her mother understood this thing called life. After learning of her mother's vast knowledge of life, I said, Mom, I want to move Ruth in with me, and I swear I'll take as good care of her as you and your husband have. Mom was a real trooper. She went along with what I asked, saying, Stonewall, Ruth really cares for you. In fact, she's been stuck on you since she was bothering that. I and my husband like you too, so please take good care of her, Stonewall. Treat her kind. We give you both our blessing. I was so thrilled till I kissed her all over and promised to care for her till death do us part. Chapter 8 That morning when I got up, it was 5.30. By the time I reached Walter's pad, it was 6 a.m. The ape had been called and would be ready and waiting. We picked the ape up at 6.30, and by the time we hit the highway, it was 7 a.m. sharp. We had five hours to get there, so we could forget about the sweat of being there at lunchtime. It was a cinch. While rolling along at a pace within the speed limit, one of the girls wanted to stop and eat, but I iced it because I didn't want to blow the lunch hour. And I knew we can always eat after we reached Gary. The big Buick easy rolled us, and we reached Gary at 10.45 a.m., which meant we had some time to kill before hit time. 
We went to a restaurant, a place we ate whenever we were in town. After we ate, I checked to see if my prop was in the right pocket and found it was cool. We then went to a bar to kill some more time till it was righteous for us to move in on a sting. We reached the store at five past noon and I parked the car while the girls went in. I anchored in the car for ten minutes, then I went on in to play my part. When I entered the store, I dug the team of thieves in the rear of the store and saw they really did need help. It was my job to get them the freedom they needed. The store was made to order for the part I had to play to get them that much needed freedom that they had to have in order to sting. I double checked my prop because I didn't want to blow my part. I was a true master at it and got a bang out of doing it. It was always thrilling to me when everything came off like clockwork. I motioned to one of the lovely sales girls and when she came, I laid the con on her. Good afternoon, I said. Has a lady been in this store today with a set of twin boys? Twins? Oh no, she said. I'm sure there hasn't been anyone in the store with twins today. The, um, this is Carson's, isn't it? I said. Yes, this is Carson's first. Well, I'm in the right place anyway. My name is Dulane, Marcel Victor Dulane, and I was to meet my wife here today. She's been paying on a mink coat here for quite some time now, and today is the day she was to pick it up. She had a few other stops to make, and I was to meet her here and the kids here at Carson's and take them home. Is it all right if I wait for her? Why, of course. Please have a seat. I looked toward the rear of the store and saw a sales girl staying too close to the two girls with the larceny in their hearts. She was being overly helpful. Yeah, they needed freedom badly, and they needed it right away. I called the sales girl and said, You know, I've always wondered just what it was about a mink coat that caused it to become an obsession with the female sex. May I look around while I'm waiting for my wife? But of course, feel free to look over the store, she said. I thanked her and I walked over a display of minks in the center of the floor. While I was looking through them, I suddenly gasped out loud and grabbed my chest. When I had the attention of the clerks, I fell over a rack of minks and other furs and lay seemingly helpless on a pile of furs that must have been worth $50,000. Everyone in the store broke a record coming my way to see what had happened and to give whatever aid they could. This freed the girls so they could hit without sweat. The sales manager bent over me and started to unbutton my shirt and loosen my belt. I motioned for him to get the pills from my pocket. He reached in my kick and came out with my prop, then sent one of the sales girls to get some water. While she was gone for the water, the two crooks walked up and stood over me, which meant they had copped. Then they split to the car to wait till I came out of my thing to meet them. The sales girl returned with the water, and the manager gave me two pills. I got up and shucked a while, stalling, till the store was back in order. After I'd bullshitted long enough, I told the sales girl, I'm quite sorry about what happened, and I'd like to ask a favor of you. Please don't mention to my wife about my heart. I've kept it from her, and I beg of you, please let it remain that way. When she comes, Please tell her I was here, but had to leave on business. And above all, I'd like to thank all of you for your warm concern. She agreed with what I had asked, and I split. When I got to the car, the girls were nervous and wanted to hurry and get out of Gary. Forty-five minutes out of town, we stopped for gas, and so the girls could answer nature's call and also clean up the pieces they had stolen. All tags have been removed from the furs as soon as they got in the car, and they dumped them out of the car window as we rolled along the highway. All they had to do now was put them in bags while in the ladies' room at the gas station. The ape 
went into the ladies room first, leaving me and my half of rib alone. She told me she wouldn't have to make another stop to ready me up, cause she had got me a mink stole. I took it and put it in a trunk. When the ape came back, we headed for Detroit. Since my half a rib didn't have to make another stop to ready me up, it meant I'd be back in Detroit long before 10 p.m. And if I wanted to, I could have shortened it even more. But since we were riding with 40,000 bucks worth of minks, I moved the wheel within the speed limit. At 6 p.m., we reached Motor City. It hadn't been a bad trip at all. Two mink coats at 14000 each and a mink stole worth $750. Yup, not bad at all. Eight bills from the girls and a mink stole for myself. My man and the outlaw had the real bread. But think how much an hour that came to. When we hit Detroit, I took the ape home and waited till she came out with my bread. And as she gave it to me, it looked like it hurt her to her heart. I then took my half a rib home and walked up with her to see if Walter was home. But he wasn't, so I told her I'd dig her later and I'd catch him on the edge. I drove by my pad and set the stole down and then I went by Napoleon to dig my man and get my cookies. I dug him in the hat shop, drank it with some of the fellows, and pulled him out of earshot of the gang. Everything came off silky and kosher, I said. Your rib is at home waiting on you, and the sooner you get home, the sooner you find yourself $14,000 richer. If you have any sweat down in that Charlie, take it to Ruby at the restaurant. She's been bugging me to get her one, and you know there's no sweat for your money. Come on, run me home, he said. I like to dig what a Charlie like that looks like. When he got in the car, he gave me my bread with a smile on his face. It kind of made me feel like a real asshole. He paid me with a smile, and I was laying his rib. Well, what the hell? I thought the bitch was laying me. When we got to his pad, he asked me to come up and have a taste. I iced it by telling him I had business elsewhere, and I split feeling great. My bankroll was fat, and I had a mink stole that would bring me another few bills. Yup, everything was roses, and this was the night I was gonna move Ruth in with me. You know, she was to be the very first female that I'd ever lived with, and take it from me, I really liked the whole idea. Well, I moved Ruth in with me and gave her a twister and told her not to let even her best friend know where she lived because her friend might tell a man and he might tell his pal and the next thing we know, the city of Detroit will be hip. I told her to let it be hush-hush to everyone but her family. And I told her to tell her folks not to let any swinging d know. I was playing behind what my brother Willie had hit me to. Let no hugging know nothing about you. I was feeling swell about life. I was just 17 and was already getting me a taste of the silky life. And I swear, I was happy beyond all expression about the whole damn thing. I took my rib to her edge, kissed her, and set her out. I then went by Chuck's pad to rap, smoke, and enjoy the life of two young pimps. Chuck had two brothers who were quite young and thought me and Chuck to be the last word and pimped them. They used to peek through the keyhole and watch us while we smoked and rapped. One of them is still around today and doing a little mac in himself. I think the world of Chuck's young brother, but I doubt if he'll ever become a true pimp because Joe Chink is riding on his back. Still, he might because he's in one of those methadone programs that has come into being within the past few years. 
whether he makes it or not, the little is and always will be my mellow fellow. Me and Chuck smoked and rapped for some time. Then I cracked. Chuck, baby, now that we got our heads in order, let's ride and see if we can't pluck off a hunk of cheesecake. We both know we can't win a million dollars in the dime crap game, so let's hit the street of broken dreams and the valley. Who knows? This might be our night. God knows we can't pluck a bitch here. So we split, and that night, we both copped a girl. Time moved swiftly. Ruth had been staying with me for close to six years, and my other two girls had been doing it like it should be done. Chuck, Walter, and me made all the pin parties. We went to New York to a few fights, and we made about seven derby runs together. It was now the year of 1943, the year of the race riot, and I had Ruth from the time she was By now she was 18, and I was 22. And if I said the years weren't silky, I'd be telling a big fat mouth lie. Cause God knows the years were quite tasty. Quite tasty indeed. Then one night at a party, the fellow started to jive my man Walter by telling him things like, Stoney's been getting as much money for driving your woman as you. They no doubt had been jiving him like that before, but for some reason he never came to me with it. But this night was different. He said out loud that I must have been making it with his woman and that her last baby girl looked more like I did than it did him or his woman. The fellows were forever asking his woman why she waited till she was as old as baseball before she started to have kids. Hell, I'd even crack the same thing to him and his woman. It was just a cracking wise kind of thing, and it meant nothing. That is, till this night, I felt getting a bit heated, so I ordered another blow of cocaine and a round of drinks, and I split. When I got downstairs, my man was right on my ass, along with another top-notch pimp who I'll call Bump. My man was quite high and came into me with a lot of words that would have made a cat fight, but I didn't want to fight with him for two reasons. He was my man, even though. I was laying with his woman, and he was just too cool for me to fight with. And the other time, I'm sure he could have beat my ass, but this night, I could have beat his ass with one hand and blindfolded. So I just walked in the street while he was on the sidewalk alongside me with Bump. He was trying his best to knock me out. He was swinging helplessly trying to hurt me, and Bump was walking alongside of him, just looking. Finally, I said, Bump, baby, take him home. I told him to take him home for a whole block, from Hastings to St. Antoine, and all he did was nothing but walk alongside my man. By the time we reached St. Antoine, my man was so tired, he had to go home. Before the bump took him, I looked at bump real hard and grim, and that was the first of three times that the bump and I had differences. Elsewhere in his book, you shall run into him. Remember the first time was when he didn't make a move to freeze this thing between my man and me. I feel... Deep down in my heart, that bump wanted to see my man beat my ass. I'll always feel that way. It wasn't long after that when Chuck and I got busted while trying to rip off some diamond rings. The whole thing happened because we were both consumed by the desire to get a top-notch front that will cause us to be two of the youngest Major League Mac men in the city of Detroit. It was my thought that a cat had to have something big to hit for something big. You see, 
if a cat hits on his rib for a grand and he ain't got nothing worth a grand, the bitch can tell him he couldn't need it. He just wanted it. But if a cat pulled up sharp wearing diamonds and driving a brand new Cadillac, he could need a grand for a number of things because he would represent 25 or 30 without saying a word. He could tell a bitch he needed, not wanted, five or six big ones without her saying, What do you need that kind of money for? You ain't got nothing worth that much. And my dear Rita, there is a big difference between needing and wanting. And like I said, a cat with a front like I just mentioned could need the bread for any number of reasons. Well, anyway, me and Chuck failed on that diamond caper. Chuck, however, got away and I was arrested. I went to court, bond was set, and my little tidbit raised me. While out on bail, I told Ruth to have Chuck till I got back. She wasn't for it, but after I showed her where it was best, she accepted it. I told Chuck to look out for her and see to it that I get some bread every week. I copped out to attempted larceny and was given one to two years in a state prison at Jackson, Michigan. You already heard the song I sing? Now you know what I'm trying to bring on Ralph Reed's I Will Like or Rather Love to Thank You Queens and Kings, fellow royalty, for stopping by. If you would like to leave a small donation or connect with me on social media, please go to www.solo.to forward slash RGMC 2407. Go to YouTube, PayPal, Cash App, X, IG, Threads, Facebook group, or send an email to the Gmail at RGMC 2407. Follow the Art of Bounce podcast via its own YouTube channel or wherever you stream your favorite podcasts, Amazon, Spotify, or Apple. Again, tell a friend to tell a friend to tune in to T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. Fellow royalty, pick up a good book, read a good story, and set your good self free. I appreciate you, and I love you like cooked food. I will see you folks on the next edition of this Andrew Stonewall Jackson miniseries on Ralph Reed's. You might ask what most folks feel. They'll probably say none of this is real. How long can Nova City hide its ties to an eugenic corporation?